Well, it's great to, it's great to be with you. And um, you have really, you break my stereotypes of how Canadians are supposed to behave at band. I don't know why I say that after uh, I met Pastor uh, Joe Manifold in Saskatoon and someone there told me that he was one of a pastor of one of your larger churches. And I, after I got to know Joe, I said that Jesus is amazing. Uh, <laughs> that's all I got to say. Um, your bishop, your ever gracious bishop, I think having had experience with people coming over the border to preach, uh, he assigned me my text. He didn't trust me to <laughs> come up with my own biblical text. Here is my text. Our theme, Second Peter. His divine power has given us everything needed for life and goodness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Um, that's an odd way for Peter to address this little congregation or group of little congregations probably holding on by their fingernails at some forgotten corner of Asia Minor. Uh, is he engaging in pastoral hyperbole to say to this early congregation, uh, God has given us everything we need. I, uh, I mean, imagine I'm serving a Methodist church right now, downtown Durham, North Carolina, and we have something called the Fall Stewardship Campaign. Do you have Fall Stewardship Campaigns where you raise money for the budget? And usually as part of this campaign, the pastor sends out a letter, uh, and the letter goes something like, give us your money. We're, we, we've got to keep a roof on this place. We're about to go under. Send us your money and send us more. You've got to pledge more than you pledged last year. But I wonder if uh, Peter would send out a letter that said, uh, Hey, uh, we, we actually have everything we need this year in the way of financial resources. So don't send any of your uh, extra money to us. You just keep it yourself and use it on whatever you want to because, hey, We've got everything we need right here. In fact, we're calling off the whole fall stewardship campaign because God has given us already everything we need. And um, no, when I send out a letter to the congregation, it's usually always about what we lack, what we need. We don't have enough volunteers for this ministry. We don't have enough money for that. Uh, I had a layperson one time tell me that the theme of many of my sermons was uh, nine reasons you're not really a Christian even though you thought you were when you came to hear this sermon. <laughs> uh, had another good friend of mine say that I only preach a couple of sermons and with repeating them with infinite variations. Uh, the first sermon is, God is great, God is large, and I'm not a good enough preacher to explain it to someone as limited as you are. Uh, the second sermon is, the Christian life is demanding, and, uh, uh, and I'm not a good enough preacher to help someone like you live up to it. Uh, and, and thus I confess, it, it just seems like a lot of my ministry is about lack. Uh, and yet Peter begins his, his letter to this surely beleaguered little congregation, this nascent body somewhere out in Asia Minor, and... Uh, by outrageously declaring, God has given us everything needed for life and godliness. Sometimes we preachers, uh, our cheerleaders, 
uh, many times we, we preachers find it's really helpful to praise a congregation for their good behavior. And if you do that, they may behave better. And I remember being in a congregation in Alabama when I was bishop there, and we were going into the service, and the pastor stood up and he said, let me just now say, Bishop, I, and he sort of got kind of choked up, and he said, I just can't believe that you sent me to such a wonderful church. This church, th this church says some of the best people in the world. This is the warmest, friendliest, most welcoming congregation. And I thought, now this is the same church that this morning I rattled three different doors that were locked as I tried to get in the building. This is the same church where the only reason I'm here is to meet with a committee this afternoon because you, same preacher who just said that, had called me and said, Bishop, you got to get me out of this hell hole or my wife is going to divorce me. I can't take it. This is some of the meanest people in the world. Is that what's happening here in this letter from Peter? Uh, I wonder. And yet, and yet Peter says, you, you know, we got all we need. God has given us all we need for godliness and for life. Now, Peter does not mean that as a compliment to this congregation. He is not talking about their innate congregational virtues, but rather he is making a statement about God, about the nature of God. Uh, God has given us everything we need. It is impossible to exhaust the resources that this God gives us. Impossible to use up the grace. Impossible to, to uh, consume too much of the, the love and the wonder-working power. Uh, there is something in the nature of this God that, that is abundance. You remember the stories Jesus told. A farmer went out to sow seed. And the farmer uh, very carefully removes all the rocks and the weeds from the ground. And then he plows each fur furrow uh, straight uh, 12 inches apart. And then he takes the seed, puts one seed 6 inches apart from another seed, covers over half an inch of seed. No! A sower goes out to sow and just starts slinging seed everywhere and slinging some of it on the road and some of it in the middle of weeds without any prior preparation, just slinging seed everywhere. And yet, Jesus says, in spite of that kind of sloppy farming, uh, there was abundant harvest. Uh, or, did you hear the one about the mustard seed, the tiniest of all seeds, and yet you put that mustard seed in the ground, and Jesus says it germinates and it becomes a, it grows and it grows and it grows to be a weed of about two feet high. Uh, birds can nest in its branches, very, very small birds, but still they could if they had good balance. <laughs> and the disciples say, Lord, we don't, that's not the most flattering image of your kingdom. A bunch of weeds sprouting out everywhere. And yet, here is a Savior that sees us not as small and insignificant, but, but as indications of God's abundance. And of course, you, you know the story about John begins his gospel taking Jesus and his disciples to uh, bash uh, after a wedding. And uh, no sooner than they get there, then the wine runs out, which is what you have happen when you have 12 unattached men show up at a wedding party. <laughs> and uh, then Jesus miraculously transforms these 
jugs of water into 180 gallons of wine. Now, I'm a Methodist, I don't know, but that still seems like a lot of wine. And uh, it was overflowing up to the brim. Or, you remember the time that Jesus and his disciples tried to get away for a little Sabbath rest? And he says, hey, you've done such a good job. Let's go to a deserted place. Let's take a vacation. Well, they get to where they're going and hungry, hurting crowds have heard Jesus is going to be there, so they've run ahead of them. And so Jesus sits them all down and they, and he lectures them, he teaches them. And then it grows dark and the disciples say, hey, send them away to get something to eat. It's getting late. And Jesus says to them amazingly, you give them something to eat. And we say, where are we going to get enough food to feed? There's got to be 5,000 people here. I mean, not counting the women and the children. And uh, then what have you got? Well, we got nothing but these, a couple of loaves, a couple of cold fish. Okay. And he takes what we have and he blesses it and he gives it. And wonder of wonders, it's enough. No, the, the story doesn't say it's enough. It says there was a bunch of leftovers. It was just, there was more than enough. There was abundance. There is something kind of built into who this God is that bespeaks abundance. Uh, there's a great deal of gloom in our world. And yet, John says, the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has never ex succeeded in overcoming it. There's just a surfeit of light. There's this luminosity that always is more than the darkness. Yesterday uh, was my 68th birthday. And I uh, celebrated it with a few people who <laughs> claim that they're free church, uh, a Methodist, uh, free, free Methodist pastors. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but it's occurred to me that, you know, now that I'm this age, uh, there's at least, I, I don't know by my estimate, at least a thousand sermons left in Scripture that I have not yet preached. I'm going to die with only making a small dent in all the revelation that is in Scripture. Uh, I'm going to have to hand it off to somebody else. And... Uh, that's kind of amazing because I've been at this for over four decades. Um, but there's just something about this God that, that is abundance. And I think that's hard for us to get because we, you see, are modern people. And it is, it's of the nature of modernity to be reductionistic. Uh, modern ways of knowing, the way you know something is you... You peel away all the uh, extra stuff about whatever you're trying to understand, and you get down to the nub, you get down to the essential, you get down to the core. The three reasons uh, for the American Civil War, the, uh, the five causes of the Great Depression, that is so typical of modernity. Uh, this is the way I studied scripture in seminary. You take this bubbling, oftentimes strange biblical text and uh, uh, applying historical criticism. You, you peel away all the accumulated uh, doctrinal uh, 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 pietistic stuff and you get it down to the absolutely unassailable, certifiably official reading of this text. Uh, the one thing you can say, in fact, most of the biblical study I had in seminary was like, 15 things you cannot say with authority about this biblical text. And uh, no wonder we got out of seminary and said, hey, I really, I don't have anything to say. Uh, I was telling uh, the rabbi at our place uh, at Duke Chapel, University Chapel, I was telling him that I was going to, hey, uh, you're Jewish, I'm going to be preaching on some of your stuff Sunday uh, from... Uh, from Genesis 2. 
And he said, what are you going to say about it? I said, well, I'm taking uh, Genesis 2 and I'm, I'm, I'm focusing in on, 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 on this, on the significance of this. And he smiled and he said, when I was in rabbinical school in New York, that text was on one of our exams. And I had to come up on my exam with at least 15 different and all valid rabbinical interpretations of that passage. See, that's a very different way of looking at Scripture as not, not to get down to the one absolutely certifiable uh, right idea, but rather to let Scripture blossom, to let it flourish in different contexts and in different readers. Um, we've got much more God than we'll ever be able to comprehend. Uh, certainly more God than we'll ever be able to explain or contain. And yet, there are people who think, you know, we've arrived at the summit of human development where we now look at the world straight without any, you know, unencumbered by prejudices and superstition and tradition and, and um, uh, we can see so much more than our ancestors. We stand on the summit of development, uh, Rob Ford, and uh, th that, I know that's painful and I, anyway, I just had to throw that out. Um, and yet, Increasing numbers of modern people are wondering that if in modernity we did not grow but we shrank. And, and I've noticed this among college students that there is a sense in which there is a yearning for a thicker, deeper, richer description of reality than that which is offered by officially sanctioned ways of explaining the world and ourselves, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of postmodern desire uh, for a world that, that is not demystified, a, a world that, that where our descriptions are complex enough adequately uh, to be truthful. Uh, years ago, uh, Patsy and I went to a movie called Magnolia, in which uh, uh, Tom Cruise uh, starred in it. Is he Canadian? Tom Cruise? That's just as well. Um, <laughs> and, um, and anyway, it's a very dark movie. You go through this movie, and toward the end of the movie, this couple is in a car talking about their relationship, and then suddenly these frogs start dropping out of the sky and onto the car, onto the windshield. And they have to turn on the windshield. These frogs are splattering on the windshield. And um, you hear over the car radio, there's been a tornado at a lake nearby and you know, maybe, but these frogs, are, and we're in a movie house with a bunch of college students. The college students start chanting and applauding and yelling. And um, Patsy said, well, what, what, what are the, why are they cheering? And, and I said, I know these people. I minister among them. <laughs> and there is a sense in which, until the frogs start dropping out of the sky, whatever it is, it's not true. That, that they are yearning for a richer description of reality than has been afforded to them by state-controlled education. And so, and I'm saying that those of us who work with this pre-modern uh, book, scripture, uh, that, that, and I, I know as a campus evangelist, I have noted that one of the biggest impediments to people affirming the Christian faith is scripture. Because, and the complaint is, scripture is too complicated. There are too many different points of view in fact, I had a student complain that there were four Gospels. <laughs> and he said, you'd think if the thing was true, y'all would have settled on one Gospel. I said, we tried that. 
the Diatessaron and the guy who was condemned of heresy and everything was taken up and burned. And, and, uh, but, but you kind of forget. And, and, you know, that there's something about Jesus Christ that cannot be adequately articulated with only one voice. It takes these four voices uh, speaking. That's the kind of complex, rich, thick reality we get to deal with. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Uh, wow. Maybe we could say just for the beginning of our conference that, that one of the great challenges of being in the church is to, is to see the church as, as just having more truth than we can possibly share. Uh, a, a richer, deep, deeper description of reality than a lot of Western, North American, modern people uh, can, can, can consume and handle. Uh, and thus, unfortunately, we pray, Lord, please give me a surefire, knock down, absolutely foolproof technique for getting more church members. Uh, give me the absolutely uh, quickest way to boost uh, attendance. Uh, please, Lord, give me a method for preaching that I will not have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit to make it work. Uh, <laughs> Lord, give us a conference this weekend that, that, that will be effective and a workshop that will produce uh, me the, the, the kind of church that I deserve to have. And um, if you notice, rarely are we given techniques, three easy steps to uh, a surefire, absolutely effective. What he gives us is himself. He, he comes to us. The Christian faith is not a set of five fundamentals, four spiritual laws. It's a Jew from Nazareth who lived briefly and died violently and rose unexpectedly and then returned to the same losers who disappointed him the first time. Uh, that's what it is. And, uh, you know, those of you who are married know how really complex and confusing a person can be. Uh, and to be a Christian is, is to be related to that. And, and I wonder, I wonder if sometimes we produce churches that are not nearly as interesting as Jesus means them to be. Uh, that, that maybe unintentionally we have limited the, the scope of the kingdom. That unintentionally we have limited the, the expanse of salvation to people that look a lot like me and think a lot like me. Uh, and therefore, church is not nearly as interesting as the Holy Spirit means it to be. When I was bishop down in Alabama, after 20 years at Duke University Chapel, uh, one of the questions I would often get in Alabama is, Bishop, what do you miss most about your life uh, in academia as opposed to your new life as a church bureaucrat? And uh, <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. But I, I got the question enough, I said, you know, the thing I miss most is the Duke University Office of Undergraduate Admissions because they did such a wonderful job of ensuring that I could go through every day at the university and be sure that I never had to encounter anybody who didn't think and talk like me. Uh, a lot of them had different uh, races and different backgrounds and all, but the undergraduate office of missions made darn sure they all had the same political opinions I did, and it was just wonderful. We had the best time together. Well, well down here in Alabama in the church, uh, Jesus won't let us have an admissions committee. Uh, 
we, we have to work with anybody he drags in the door. And uh, it makes for some really unpleasant church meetings because uh, you're stuck in there with these people for whom Jesus died that, uh, that, that I don't enjoy. And so I'd say I miss most the, the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. And, But could we see that? Could we see that as a sign of God's beneficence and generosity? Uh, I called a pastor serving an inner city church. His house had been broken into twice in one year, everything stolen. He's got young children. I said to him, Look, you've been at that church for five years. That's got to be a tough context. And uh, we're going to move you to a, uh, a less demanding kind of suburban church. And uh, just, just want you to know that. And he said, uh, uh, Bishop, that's not that good an idea. Uh, he said, have you ever heard me preach? And I said, no, but I, I will hear you preach. Uh, I'm sure b before moving time comes. And he said, well, if you hear me preach, you're going to find out I'm not that great a preacher. Um, he said, you know, I, uh, I, I'm not like you. I can't come up with a bunch of sappy illustrations and, and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm not very artistic. Uh, I just got to, like, you know, stick the gospel out there and let it go and, you know. Uh, so, so I got to have a church with, with full of desperate people. Uh, where you don't have to kind of work the gospel up for them. You just shove it at them and, and uh, they're so desperate and they're going down for the third time and they're so screwed up, they just say, oh yeah, that sounds like good news. And uh, so I, I can't go to some church that does not have a high percentage of really miserable, desperate people. Well, that maybe God has given us all we need and maybe the problem is not so much that God's holding something back from us but rather that our ministries our church life is not expansive imaginative enough to receive uh, the good that God gives us I was in a congregation praising them for their prison ministry they have three different kinds of prison ministries in men's and women's prisons and I said, I don't know of a church in our conference that is this active in the church. I told them, I said, by the way, John Wesley and his sermons, they had 220 references to the importance of prison ministry. He just felt there was not much wrong with any Christian. Couldn't be improved by, by getting with the incarcerated. And so I was just praising the pastor for this. And he said, I can't take any credit in it. He said... Bishop, I had never served a church with this many ex-cons in it. <laughs> and said, it's just amazing. Said, uh, we got people just, uh, you know, we got felons. We've got uh, people, uh, financial crimes. We, we've got a whole group of sexual crime people. And uh, it's just wonderful. <laughs> Jesus may be giving us in abundance it's just our problem is we, we're not adequately receptive to his peculiar ideas about abundance. Uh, and yet he gives us himself. And he is, we believe, all we need. We believe that in him, in this one who lived briefly and died violently and rose unexpectedly, We've seen as much of God as we ever hoped to see. We have seen more of God's will for the world than we'll be ever to be faithful to and process. It was my fourth Easter at Duke University Chapel. And you pastors know what that means. I'd already preached my two good Easter sermons <laughs> twice. And uh, so... I was thinking, oh man, Easter. And I got this sophisticated, intellectual, academic congregation, and here I got to talk about a 
Jew that was tortured to death by the government, and then he was back. And uh, that is so, so hard for these skeptical, critical, standoffish, intellectual people. Lord, give me something. And um, that very Sunday in Lent, a student comes out of the chapel, and I'm talking to him, and I said, wow, you, you're you a frequent attender. I'd like to get to know you better. And I said, why don't you come home with uh, me this uh, today and I'll fix you a sandwich and, and uh, you tell me your story. And he said, I've been wanting to tell you my story. I'd like to. So uh, took him home after church, made him a sandwich. We sat out on the patio and I said, well, Jason, tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about how you got to Duke and all. And he said, uh, okay. I said, well, look, uh, I was a teenager from hell. I made my parents' lives miserable. Uh, and I said, well, that's <clears throat> not that original a story. We hear that here from time to time. And he said, uh, I mean, I was bad. He said, when I was 16, my parents had me committed uh, to an institution for the mentally ill. And I said, really? I, I didn't know we parents had that <laughs> option. And. He said, but I hated that place, and uh, I broke out of there in two weeks. And I hitchhiked to Chicago, and I started living on the streets. And I supported myself, uh, you know, mostly through prostitution. And uh, I sometimes would rob some of the people. And so one night, I, I rolled this uh, businessman, and uh, anyway, I took his wallet, and uh, took his American Express card and I went on this binge and I said wow I, I thought when you said you were bad you meant you you did stuff with cheerleaders in high school and, and that you weren't wow and he said I said I was bad I said okay yeah well that's bad that's very bad <laughs> and um, said anyway they caught me and I was sent to Juliet and uh, he said that place is hell he said, I went down to the seventh circle of hell in that prison. And he said, I was only 19 years old. And he said, this uh, older prisoner took me under his wing and, and tried to protect me. And each night before lockdown, he would read to me a chapter out of the Bible. And um, he wasn't a very good reader. And so it took forever to get through that chapter. And I, I, I didn't grow up in a religious home. I didn't know nothing about the Bible. So we're in the middle of like Luke's gospel. And I guess maybe that's because, you know, about the lost uh, sheep and the lost coin. And uh, Anyway, while, while this guy is reading and stumbling over the words, I mean, suddenly it's like Jesus Christ gets into that cell and he slams me back against the wall, and he says to me, I own you. I got plans. And he said, it, it scared the hell out of me. And uh, I got my graduate equivalent degree. I got out of there. I got a full scholarship to Michigan State, but I always wanted to come to Duke, so I transferred my sophomore year here to Duke, and I'm making straight A's, and uh, uh, I just... You know, I just wanted to tell you about that. And I said, that is an amazing story. And, and he said, look, I'm telling you this because uh, I know you preachers and uh, you got Easter coming up. <laughs> and uh, I know you're always grubbing around for some kind of sermon illustration. And here, here's my point. Uh, I... I'm the only proof you've got of Easter. <laughs>